history against the Roman uh, Republic. You have uh, Aristotle and Plato talking about freedom and democracy, although they're under, it was pretty limited in terms of the people they wanted, they thought should be free. And, and so this notion of freedom has a long history uh, in, the, in the world. Now, over time, the definition of, of freedom has changed. Initially, it's very interesting to go over. We don't have time to, to go over the history, except to say, so early on in Western civilization, one of the bases for freedom was the sense that we were created by God. And a lot of our freedom actually stems from Judeo-Christian uh, understandings. And uh, over time, though, when we hit the Enlightenment, then the basis for freedom was kind of rationality and will. And, you know, you can read some of this in the uh, Declaration of Independence and some of the documents that were... And then after that, in terms of... It was seen that it was a historical process that was leading to, to this kind of freedom. So there's been uh, different bases that people understood their freedom came from. And then finally we have arrived to today and in late modernism, sometimes it's called postmodernism, all of those other bases have been disallowed. And so for a postmodernist, One, there is no God, there is no cosmic order, there's no such thing as human nature or human purpose, there is no such thing as truth, nor is there anything, any absolute morality. So given that there is really nothing out there to subscribe us, the, the best way we can be, we are free to do whatever we want and to be whatever we want to be. And that is the message, and it's probably, as I said, the only, and, and this is Robert Muth, who is a sociologist, sociologist and associates, would say, in our current situation, probably the only widely publicly shared value is that with that definition. And actually, I would encourage you, so when you're watching the Super Bowl today, when you're watching advertisements, when you're going to see movies, when you're talking with friends, kind of keep your antenna out to this notion of freedom and kind of the assumptions that go along with our culturally had held beliefs with freedom. Now, Tim Keller, in his book, argues that this last notion, this late notion of freedom is actually really run off the tracks and it's not good for society, it's not good for culture. And he gives five reasons. I hope I have time to get to them. But he gives five reasons. The first is this, it's unworkable. We talk about freedom, but there are really multiple freedoms, for example. Suppose um, I love red meat. I, you know, I just I love red meat, you know, the blood dripping out of the meat, you know, just really, you know, I, I, you know, prime rib steak. And I go to my doctor, and, and also suppose I have a pretend. Um, and so I really like spending time with my grandchild. So I go to the doctor, and the doctor says, well, Phil, he, you know, he looks at, you know, he does the blood test and everything. He said, your, your cholesterol is, you know, is just off the charts. Your blood pressure is way too high. If you don't change your diet, you need to cut red meat out of your diet. And if you don't do this, it wouldn't surprise me if you had a heart attack in two years. Okay? Well, so I have a choice there. If I want to live and spend time then it looks like the way to do that is to curb my freedom of eating all that red meat that I want. But if I don't do that, I can eat all that red meat that I want. 
all the red meat I want, that I'll have more years to spend with my grandchild. See, what happens when those things we want contradict one another and oppose one another? That's frequently the case. You can't be free in everything. There have to be choices that we make, and there is a way in which living certain ways, we know Well, we need to restrict some freedoms so that we have the freedom to do and live other ways. Do you follow that? I think that's a very, very important understanding. No one can do everything because our wants and, and uh, our needs frequently conflict with one another. So the question is not, can I be free to do anything, but what are the freedoms I need to restrict so that I can live well and fully for what is truly important to me. So what, what Keller says is that real freedom comes from a strategic loss of some freedoms in order to gain others. It is not the absence of constraints, but it is the choosing of the right constraints and the right freedoms to love. So the first point is just the way we talk about it. The second thing he says is it's unjust. Why is it unjust? The notion that I'm an autonomous human being and I can do whatever I want actually is totally false. We are incredibly social creatures, ultra-social creatures. Most of my, when I was a baby and a child, I was totally dependent on my parents and other caregivers to, to raise me. There have been many people who have invested their lives in me. I am dependent now. I am not just an autonomous individual, like a billiard ball bouncing off. I have connections and relationships. I have responsibilities to other people. I owe other people love and support. So for me to just go and say, well, I'm this autonomous human being. No one can tell me to do anything. Not only is that not workable, but it's also unjust to those uh, in our community who have given themselves and offered themselves to us so that we might grow and thrive and be fulfilled in that way and have loving relationships. So not only is it unworkable, not only is it unjust, it also can't stand alone. And what I mean by this and what Kim Tim this is, pretty much in a lot of our secular society, they say really the only value should be this. We should be free to do whatever we want to do so long as it doesn't harm anybody else. It's kind of the harm condition. I should be free to do whatever I want to do, except as long as it doesn't harm anybody. Now, as Keller says, this is actually useless and disingenuous. Now, why is that? Because the assumption for that is we all agree on what harm is. So, let's say, for an example, no fall of course. Someone has no fall of course. They say, that's great. We really think that. Other people say, I think no fall of course is really a is a good thing. I don't think it's good for the or take obscenity laws. I think these obscenity laws are restricting my freedom. If I want to view pornography in my private, you know, my private space, what difference does that make to other people? Another person would say, well, actually viewing pornography in your in the private space is shaping you. It's likely to get have not have a very positive effect on your relationship with women, and it's going to be not good for society. So the point is, for that, for that kind of rule to obtain, we would all have to agree on what harm is. But we don't all agree on what harm is. And what we decide is harmful is based on our image, our, our understanding of what it is to be human. And what is the purpose of human life? And what is human worship? And we don't have that. We have a vast array of different senses. So, so to say that that should be our main 
uh, decider of what is right and wrong or what we want to do. It's bogus. It doesn't work. We need other values. We need other ways of determining uh, what we should be doing and what is right. The fourth thing he says is it's corrosive to relationships. It's corrosive to relationships and community. Alex Tocqueville, those of you, the social critic, a French social critic who came through America, this is conundrum, something he was very concerned with because he noted that for a healthy society, you need a lot of volunteerism, you need people to be selfless, you need to be giving, there needs to be a high degree of, of being to offer yourself to support others. But in the FCA, the American Freedom, you do what you want to do when you want to do it, your own thing. He noticed that if, if we actually follow that way, that will actually work again. So when a society is rich and thick with those, the society can flourish, but the more you focus on your independent, autonomous freedom, it is destructive of those things. It breaks that down, and then the result is a more kind of a soft tyranny with a big bureaucratic government coming in and imposing itself. The key, I think, is this. Freedom, in some ways, is anti- If you love someone, and you get to know someone, and you love someone, and you grow in intimacy, on the one hand, it's very liberating, but it really cramps your independence, doesn't it? If you're going to love someone and, and have this mutuality and grow in love with that person, it puts a huge uh, barrier, so to speak, on all the freedoms, the other freedoms that you want to do. You, you voluntarily choose not to do certain things so that you can be with and love and support the person or persons that you love. So there's a voluntary binding, so to speak, this voluntary sacrificing of our freedoms in order to love. David Ford, a theologian from Cambridge, wrote a book many years ago that I loved, and, and I got this phrase from his book. He talks about the binding freedom of love. I love that phrase. Think about that. To really love someone, in a way, binds our freedoms. In another sense, it really liberates us. It really um, works against freedom. If I am going to be a faithful husband and father and grandfather, could be inconvenient, that maybe I don't want to All of these things are involved if we're to love people truly. And so I think Keller uh, makes the point that to love, to have deep loving relationships is an automatic uh, binding of our freedoms. And the fifth thing he says is this. The freedom that we talk about that's very, uh, that we celebrate in our own culture is what's called negative freedom. It's freedom from. And there's a problem with freedom from. Michael Clark of Harvard Law School says that negative freedom, freedom from, that's positive freedom, it's empty conceit. Whether freedom is good or bad depends entirely on the particular substantive case on behalf of which freedom is invoked. In other words, freedom is not an end, it's a mean. And so it's entirely the freedom To say that I'm totally free, 
Well, that's really not the purpose of life. That's like, well, no, that's, that's really kind of empty. The purpose of my life isn't to be safe. It's to do something or be something. think that freedom is the ultimate Paul says in Galatians, he says, it's for freedom that Christ set you, set you free. He says that because if we really give ourselves to Christ in love, he's going to reorder our desires and, uh, and guide our life. So we don't have to worry in a, in a sense. He says, if you really are giving your life to Christ, St. Augustine says, love God and do what you will. Because if you love God, everything's going to be reordered. So I would like to encourage you to be to have your antenna out this week. Just whatever you're doing, whether you're talking with someone or whether you're watching TV or something, see it when what you hear. What's kind of the subtext for some of the advertisements and some of the things and the statements that are being made? Because as followers of Jesus, we are called into the binding freedom of love. God didn't uh, free the Israelites so they could wander around forever and do whatever, whatever they wanted. He freed them from the Egyptians so they could be free to love God and practice the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and your strength. He freed them to love God. And so we are freed in Christ to love God. He's called us into that binding freedom of love.